Chapter 9 is about electrons, and the first part will be light and electrons. Light is a type of electromagnetic radiation, and it is all around us. It includes radio waves, visible light, x-rays, etc. Light travels through space at a speed of 3.8 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, which is a very fast speed. And the wave itself can be described by certain characteristics. One of them is the wavelength. So this piece right here, the distance from one peak to the next is called the wavelength, and it's given that Greek letter lambda. And um, another way you can look at it is the frequency as a time that it takes to complete an oscillation. So frequency and wavelength are two characteristics used to describe light. Visible light, different color, means different wavelengths and different energies. So the light we see from the sun, it doesn't look like it has a color, but it is actually made up of many colors. And you can separate light into its different colors with a prism. So a prism is a wedge-shaped piece of glass or, or even like a drop of water. And as the light passes through it, different wavelengths are deflected more or less and so it separates it into the colors and you've all seen a rainbow and that's what causes it it's the sunlight um, going through the drops of water and a prism works the same way and the important thing to know about this is that color indicates energy okay so color wavelength and energy are all connected and the red has the lower energy the violet has the higher energy, but when you see a color, it indicates a particular energy. Visible light is just a small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. As you can see, only this little region right there is what we can see. And then there's wavelengths much longer in the radio waves and FM and AM, microwaves, IR, and wavelengths much shorter in the ultraviolet, x-ray, and gamma rays. So when you look at white light, like the light from the sun, what you get is something called a continuous spectrum that looks like that, where you can see all the colors blending into each other. Now, it's a different thing if you look at an element. So in this tube on the side here, there is hydrogen gas in the tube, and a current is run through the tube and the gas glows. Now, if this light is passed through a prism, you don't see individual lines. Uh, you don't see a continuous spectrum. What you see is these individual lines. And it's unique for every element. So you can see that hydrogen has those three lines. Helium has different lines. Neon has different lines. And they have different colors. And so this is a piece of evidence that's used to describe electrons in atoms. So this is the Niels Bohr model um, of the atom. Um, what he figured out is that these different colors represent electrons. So electrons are in different specific energy levels. And um, they stay in the lowest possible energy, which is called the ground state, unless energy is put in and moves them to a higher state, which is called the excited state. So you can think of an atom as having a nucleus and then it'll have energy levels, okay? And we describe these by the quantum numbers one, two, three, four, etc. So these energy levels are sort of like steps on a ladder. If you visualize a ladder, and I'm gonna draw the ladder kind of funny. I'm gonna make a big space between the first two steps and have them get closer together. Um, so as the orbitals, as the orbits um, get smaller, the difference, it gets smaller as you go up in energy. So um, the first level and the second level are farther apart. So that's kind of the idea. And each, each level has different numbers of electrons it can hold. And this is, gets us to the concept of quantized versus continuous. We see the world as a very continuous place, and I like to think of a ramp. 
as continuous. If you have a rock rolling down a ramp, it just rolls smoothly down the ramp. It's continuous. But if it's rolling down a step of stairs, it drops from step to step to step, and that would be quantized. Um, so we see the world continuous because we see macroscopic, but really the world is very quantized, and the energy in an atom comes in little discrete packets. And so what you see um, in the hydrogen spectrum is represented in this drawing right here, that if you excite the electron from the first level out to a higher level, as it drops back down, it'll release energy. And if it drops from the three to the two, it's a red line. And from the four to the two, it's a blue green line. And the five to the two, it's the violet line. And um, remember that color represents energy and the violet has more energy because it's farther drop. And so you can see those lines and what they mean in terms of the electrons. So each shell, or what we'll call it as a quantum level, has a fixed capacity. And this chart here shows you that it's 2n squared. So the first level holds two electrons. So in the first level, we have two. The second level holds eight. And it's getting too many to draw, but the third level will hold 18, and the fourth level will hold 32. And there's some good charts on this um, in your book that you can look at. So for example, what energy level are the electrons in carbon? So if you go to your periodic table and you look up carbon, so I'm going to grab my periodic table. Carbon has an atomic number of six, so there's six electrons. Well, where are they going to go? You always want to fill the first level first. So n equals one is going to have two electrons for carbon. Okay, so that takes care of two of them. Now we have four left. So n equals two is going to have four electrons for a total of six electrons in carbon. So that's assigning each of the electrons to an energy level. The lowest level fills first, then you move up to the next level. Let's draw what the ground state electrons look like for lithium. Now remember, the ground state is the lowest possible. And so we look at the periodic table, and lithium has three electrons. So lithium would have a nucleus. And then the first energy level, remember, it holds two. So it will have two. And the second level, well, we've used up two. We have one more it'll go in the second level. So n equals 1 has 2, n equals 2 has 1. So let's go back to the idea of valence electrons, OK? So remember that the valence electrons are the outermost electrons. So let's look at the elements of fluorine and chlorine. So we have fluorine and chlorine. Okay, fluorine has nine electrons and chlorine has 17. And if you're wondering where these numbers come from, remember that's the atomic number off the periodic table. Okay, so fluorine, the first shell, what does the first shell always have? It has two electrons. The second shell Okay, now we've used up two, it's going to have seven. And that's what fluorine looks like. Chlorine, its first shell is going to have, what the first shell always has, two. The second shell will hold eight, so I'm going to put eight there. And 
And then now we're up to the third shell, and we've used 8 plus 2, that's 10, so we have 7. So notice in both these cases, we have our 7 electrons in the outer shell. This one also has 7 electrons in the outer shell. Okay? These are the inner electrons, and these are the valence electrons on the outside. Okay, so these would be the inner. So you notice they're in the same column, and they have the same number of valence electrons. Elements in a column will have the same number of valence electrons, hence they have similar properties, okay? And so there's a better table in your book that shows these, um, but notice that this first column has one valence electron. The second column has two valence electrons. Okay, let's skip the transition for now, but here the 3A have three valence electrons, the 4 have four valence electrons, and so forth until we get to 18 that has eight valence electrons. Okay, so elements in the column have the same number of valence electrons, and we've talked about this before, and valence electrons are the number on top of the column. They're also the outermost electrons, and these are going to be the ones important in reactions, so that's why this is an important concept. So we've talked about levels, and then the next step is sublevels. So we have energy levels, and we have energy sublevels. So there are four sublevels, and we give them the letters of lowercase case S, P, D, and F. So each sublevel has a unique capacity. The S can hold 2, the P can hold 6, the D 10, and the F 14. And you don't have to memorize this because you'll notice in a bit that these are also on the periodic table. So each level, so N equals 1, will have one sublevel, so it just has the S. So N equals 1 has an S, which has two electrons. That's how many the whole shell holds, it's two. When we go to N equals 2, this one will have two sublevels, S and P. And notice these add up to 8, which is the total that it can hold. We get to N equals 3, we have S, P, and D. And we add those up and we get 18, which again is our total. When we get to n equals 4, we have four sublevels, s, p, d, and f, and those will add up to 32. Okay, so you always start with the s, everybody has s, and each level higher has one more uh, sublevel as well. Now the tricky thing is that the sublevels will overlap. And there's a good figure in your book showing this, but since it's copyrighted, I'm just going to kind of approximate it. So if we think of this in terms of energy, so energy is increasing as we go up. So here's our one level. Here's our two level. Here's our three level. Here's our four. And then if we break these into 1s, and then the 2 will break into 2s and 2p, and the 3, so these are both 2, the 3 will break into 3s, 3, sorry, it's a 3, p, and 3d. And then when we get to the 4, what happens is that the 4s is actually lower in energy than the 3d. And I really recommend you look at the other PowerPoint or your book for a better uh, figure of this. But that's the idea that they're going to, it gets kind of complicated in where the electrons go because there is overlapping of the sublevel.